Good morning. Welcome to Ask the Expert, an award-winning daily series from 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. to help small businesses. Ask any questions in the comments or use the hashtag at QBATE on Twitter. If you need any more advice, join the official Intuit QuickBooks SMB community group on Facebook. Accountants and business experts are on hand 24-7. During the live session today, we will be running a poll, so please do engage with it and I'll reveal the results at the end. So today we're going to start talking about restarting your business after lockdowns. It's very disruptive at the moment for various businesses along the way, whether it's tier one, two or three, and you're asked to reopen, reclose your businesses, uh, which can be uh, very disruptive, not only to um, your customers, but also to the supply chain, to your cash flow, uh, and also to just your mental uh, well-being. Um, and when you've gone from running a smooth business during um, absolute everything's running perfectly, um, which was what happened to me personally, my business was absolutely running very, very smooth. Um, we were looking um, at 2020 to be uh, an extremely good year for us. And then through no fault of anybody's, um, the pandemic starts to uh, take control of um the future of your business uh, the only thing you can do is react to it and um, start to make sure that you um, arrange everything what goes through that very carefully uh, along the way and you know for for, for what it's worth uh, uh, my advice on those steps are um, the restarting of your business uh, during uh, and after lockdown um, has been challenging but also um, I take that as uh, a reward in the fact that it shows how it gives us a chance to show the world how strong our business really is. Um, uh, perfect example, during the first lockdown we were shut down for nearly four months. I chose to shut down for a little bit longer because I wanted to see what the um, public's response to um, the reopening of restaurants was going to be so I got my PPE, my social distancing uh, and my customer interaction from staff to customer absolutely perfect so we didn't scare anybody off. Um, I was absolutely terrified that no one would ever go back to restaurants. Um, after 34 years in the game I'd never had that um, feeling before. Once people came back uh, and they did come back and they came back thick and fast um, it gave me huge um, huge confidence in the fact that we'd already built a brand now what what could withstand recessions um, financial market collapses uh, pandemics um, it just meant that the times you're closed you uh, which then we go on to our next thing which is the negotiation of suppliers taking care of your staff uh, negotiations of rent uh, which we'll get onto in, in, in another uh, conversation in a second. Um, but what I was really, really happy with was that the social company and the social brand was strong enough to get through a pandemic. Uh, because you know, no matter how confident you are in the world, um, when you've got a business what's been directly affected as much as hospitality, it was very, very, very challenging. So once we got through that part, uh, we now had to talk about how we were going to um, negotiate with our landlords. Um, and what I felt worked for me was to go cap in hand and be there first as fast as possible. So if you have a hospitality business or any business what's struggling to pay its rent, um, what I offered my landlords was um, I wanted to not have to pay during the times of closure. So if you're paying you know, £10,000 a month rent, so £120,000 a year, uh, what I offered them was for any time we were closed, we would close, uh, we would uh, not pay rent during that period, but I will offer them half rent uh, uh, for, the, for one year total, so £60,000 a year. The other £60,000 I would add to the end of the lease. Um, so tracking back however much I think I could afford. So if I had 10 years left on the lease, tracking back from the very last year of that lease, adding that 60,000 pounds to as minimum as my landlord would, would, would accept to ease the pain. So I could put that 60,000 pounds on to the back end of the lease. And all but one have accepted that. The one is at the moment uh, negotiating with me uh, quite hard on that. And we're being quite firm because all my other landlords have accepted it. Um, and I think we're getting somewhere. So it's an, it's gave me comfort uh, knowing that that negotiation tactic worked 
quite well because at the end of the day you know you're you know for for a tenant uh which we are in most of our our sites is the one thing you have which is your ace up your sleeve is the fact that they have no one else to take their sites at the moment uh so for sure uh they they're gonna have to uh, um they're gonna absolutely have to take your offer right because who else is queuing up to take these sites the um arranging payment terms with suppliers is also another big thing for me taking care of your suppliers is very important um we uh, always put those at the front of the queue with our um, staff um so making sure that you even if you have to pay monthly uh, a little bit just to make sure you're feeding your suppliers if, you, if your cash flow is tight please make uh, account for that because without your suppliers you're nothing you have to have absolutely incredible uh, supply chains then you go on to customer expectation i feel now more than this is a really important uh, thing for me because i feel now more than ever customer expectations are through the roof so i did a big um conversation on this the other day about why would if a supplier uh, sorry if a customer is coming to you what are they expecting you know they've spent the last year ordering their clothes their shopping uh takeaways you name it looking at holidays or everything's been online uh, and now they have something tangible to come to a restaurant to experience are they you know, are they going to just want to sit and look at food pictures for the rest of their life? Or are they actually want to go and sit in a restaurant, eat something tangible, drink something incredible uh, and get this amazing experience what only restaurants can deliver? And that doesn't have to be super fine dining, uh, but it also can be just, you know, a simple pizza, a pizzeria, but it's done with love, beautiful homemade uh, pizza dough and incredible sauces and so forth. So I think that customer expectations have gone up. They're much more accepting of our industry for sure. Um, so no matter what business you're running, really invest in your customer expectations. We have done and it's paid dividends in spades. Normally for us, August is a month in London where we tend to uh, put in a small loss in our business. This August, we made money across the board uh, and it was uh, a really, really humbling experience to see so many customers wanting to come out to use our businesses because you know they are um you know they because they want to experience have another great experience so customer experience has to be number one in my opinion we are you know the the challenges what we're incurring at the moment is um you know we're going into tier three again for hospitality for christmas it's not normally our best month of the year but you know it is what it is we have to absolutely um you know embrace it keep people safe um, we have to get to the other side so again cash flow balance was the first thing we hit making sure our staff uh, can go home for christmas um, keeping them safe locking up the doors last night making sure um, everything's ready for when we come back um, and then just going back into another lockdown uh, mini lockdown ourselves um, and we're all going to enjoy christmas um, and then come back in the new year stronger and better um, and support the government in what they need to do to get us through to the other side. You know, what I feel is, is um, what I feel great is the fact that we have, um, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine. Um, I think we all can take heart in that, uh, especially our hospitality industry, what's been hit so hard. Um, yeah, so it's all, um, you know, it is, it is what it is. You know, we, um, people are saying to me, it's been unfairly hit the hospitality industry, but at the same time, it's where people do tend to gather, it's where people do tend to um, drink and um, let their guard down. So we do have to take that into consideration. Um, controlling costs is a big thing for us. Um, and it's uh, something we absolutely have to um, get on top of because without controlling our costs, uh, more than ever, and I'm talking micromanage costs, which is something we never did before. Uh, we micromanage every single cost what comes for our business. So we have reduced quite significantly um, cleaning chemicals, if you think about stuff like that, uh, all the way down to um, tiny, tiny second orders, which is something hospitality, especially restaurants, uh, thrive on in a big city like London, where we would uh, not have a bunch of basil and we would send um, uh, a phone call and the, the uh, 
delivery driver will turn up two hours later with a bunch of buzz of what someone's forgotten. Um, things like that will cost extra, extra money to keep the, the going. We keep our cash flow extremely tight. Um, you know, we unfortunately we've had to let a lot of staff go. We used to employ 1500 people. We're now down to 650. Um, it's uh, extremely difficult to make those decisions. But are, um, for me, you have to you have to make these decisions because without a business, we can't even keep 650 people employed. So it was crucial to us to keep our costs under control. So we're going to take some questions now. We've got Janet from Instagram Stories. Did you always dream of building your own restaurant empire? To be honest, Janet, that was never, ever the dream. The dream was always just to have one restaurant, which was Pollen Street Social. Uh, and that restaurant was going to be somewhere what provided um, uh, incredible food, incredible service, and somewhere where I could have freedom. And uh, that was my biggest gain um, after leaving employment and becoming my own boss. Uh, when people always say, what is the biggest thing you've achieved? I always say freedom. I go to work every day and I get to be free and do whatever I want. I put whatever I want on the menu, talk to guests, come and go as I please. You know, I work extremely hard even today, 10 years later. Um, and I love it, you know, so um, it was never the dream. Um, we will continue to chase what we chase. You know, we've got new restaurants next year. Uh, we've got something uh, very exciting soon in Saudi Arabia and also Mykonos. Uh, for next year so it's uh, extremely exciting times for 2021 we can't wait to get stuck back into uh, rebuilding uh, Amy from Instagram stories how do you unwind after a long hectic shift um, so um, uh, I always get home about uh, half 12 one o'clock in the morning uh, I'm back up and out the house by 7 8 a.m normally um, I just have a simple cup of tea watch a little bit of tv uh, catch up on news stories um, have 20 minutes myself to unwind um, and then shower in bed. That's it, really. Nothing nothing crazy like going for long runs or anything like that. I do tend to go running every morning. Um, Giles from Twitter, direct message. Hi, Jason. The pandemic has created a sense of community and camaraderie with local small business owners. I've seen yours. You supported local farm supplies on your Instagram. Any tips, advice on how we can further build the community and support each other? Absolutely, Giles. So, you know, the biggest, the absolute biggest thing for us is, is we have to support one another. It's not easy uh, because this has been this. What everyone has to remember in all this, this is nobody's fault. Businesses have been decimated through no fault of their own. Um, and they could have been businesses just being rebuilt, uh, being built up uh, as a young business or business what been in, in the trade for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, and now they've hit hard times. Um, you know, um, every business has a, 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 an ecosystem what's built around it. Um, so if you take a restaurant, it has suppliers, it has charity work, it has this, it has that. Uh, and we have to look at all of that and make sure that we still do our bit to make sure we are looking after one another. Uh, and I think that's really, really important. I think once all this is done and we come out of this, I think we'll be in a much better place as long as we don't forget it quite quickly. Um, how do you choose this from segment from Facebook Messenger? How do you choose where to open new restaurants? Is it led by market demand or your sorry, that's my that's my uh, saucer or demand or your love and passion for that place or the cuisine of that place? Well, segment, it's nothing more than I think. I re I'm really proud of this. I've never built the business off the back of having some big map in my office uh, like Doctor Evil. Um, and, and pinpointing where we want to do restaurants. Uh, we've always been organic. We've always let people come to us and ask us, would we like to do a restaurant with them or in their hotel or, or partner with them? And it's always happened that way. Uh, we've never gone looking for a restaurant. Um, so yeah, so that's how we do it really. We just sit back, we do our job every day. We let people hopefully admire our work. Uh, and if they like what we do, then we, um, we, we talk to them if we if we think it's a great opportunity and it suits our brand and it suits them and they're good partners and then we go for it you know and that's nothing more than that really so rosemary from instagram stories what is your guilty food pleasure oh, this is really bad rosemary so this is two white slices of bread this is prawn cocktail crisps this is margarine this is brown sauce and this is cheese uh, and we you squash it together very late at night, normally after a couple of glasses of wine, uh, and it makes a lovely noise, uh, and then you eat it, and then you wake up the next day extremely guilty, extremely uh, disappointed in yourself.
yourself and you clock up an extra couple of miles on, on the treadmill just to get rid of it. Chris from Twitter direct message. Hi, Jason. How do you hire up and coming chefs and nurture their talent? I'm in the final year of my diploma starting my MVQ level three. I'd love to open my own restaurant someday, but want to get some prior training under someone like you for a few years. Well, Chris, let me tell you something in life. You know, um, it's it's, you know, a lot of chefs have told me this. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, it's very, when you're young, your mind's going at a million miles an hour and you want to um, do a million things. And that's a great thing. That's energy going around your body. Um, but one bit of advice, please le- learn your craft properly. Take your time. You know, I was 39 when I opened my first restaurant. Um, and it seems uh, it was 10 years ago. It seems like an age. Um, I was so impatient. I wanted to open my own restaurant when I was 22, 24, 25, 28. I couldn't wait. Um, but you know, for some reason I just took another, uh, I should, I took another job. I went to work in Spain for free to work with Fran Adria. I went to France to work for Marc Ambalin, Gordon Ramsay for 12 years because it was a great opportunity. And then when I was, I was really ready. Because when people say, oh, my God, when you opened your restaurant 10 years ago, you exploded all over the world. But I'd already been doing that for a long time for Gordon. So I um, I was his opening chef, if you like, for different uh, concepts. So so it's, you know, take your time, learn your craft. You need to learn basics first and then go on, you know, learning all the sections in the kitchen, the pastry, the bread, the fish, the meat, all of that. And then you can start to be creative and then you can start taking managerial roles. Don't just stay, you know, if, if you like fine dining, don't always stay in fine dining. I went to learn how to run brasseries. I went to learn how to run bistros. Uh, I was running restaurants with Stephen Terry back in the day with Oliver Payton, where we were doing 350 people a night, but still cooking Michelin quality food. Uh, and all of that is extremely important for me today because it, I can do multiple concepts. So Dylan from Facebook, I've been planning on starting a resto bar for a couple of years now, but London is very expensive. I'm really passionate about food and don't want to give up. So I'm thinking about being up in a smaller city. Is this a good idea or should I wait and raise funds for a London property? Well, Dylan, the good news for you is there's not much good news in this pandemic, but pandemics has kicked the butt out of landlords. So it's extremely difficult for landlords at the moment. Um, And they're willing to work with people like us. Um, so if you're looking to do something um, very soon, the world's your oyster because you can go to a landlord right now and probably get two years rent free um, with very little rent deposit. Uh, they'll probably even put even equity into for your refit. Um, so that's where new concepts, that's our starting point. Uh, we're willing to give up a year's rent free for a little bit more equity. Um, they need people in their buildings to create life. Uh, normally, landlords will probably have a restaurant on the ground floor, maybe seven, eight uh, apartments above it, or even uh, offices, and they need life in the building. Having an empty space at the bottom is not always good for the people above. So, you know, now is the time of the tenant to negotiate with landlords, uh, and it's in it's in our favour. So take advantage of that. Uh, good morning. More than anything this year, uh, this is from Ed, Edgar on Instagram, like message, uh, more than anything this year, has been the biggest challenge to our mental strength. We'd love to know how you've coped with these challenges and how you've worked with your team and employees to keep them in good spirits. Well, even people like me um, uh, have mental health issues. It's not easy to deal with this. Uh, Pressure is a very, very strange thing. Um, I have pressure from, I have multiple pressures, multiple pressure from the business. I have staff issues. Uh, We have financial issues. Uh, We have issues um, where one day it's great, one day it's bad. Um, and then we'll have days where we're trying to run our restaurants. And uh, even though they're fully booked, uh, well, was fully booked until last night. Um, um, and then we get shut down and you've got to deal with that. So, you know, uh, just two nights ago, <clears throat> just two nights ago when um, it was announced we were going into lockdown, it was raining in London. And I find myself walking around um, London in the rain um, for no reason, just going through my head of how we're going to deal with this over the next four to six weeks, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and so forth. Uh, and you just deal with it. You know, what's, what's good is time for yourself to think, you know, 30 minutes, one hour, just to be practical and say, okay, this is not my fault. This is uh, something I've got to deal with. Um, I can't bear my head in the sand. That's the worst thing you can do. Uh, and just speak to people. That's really important, whether it's your suppliers, your staff, uh, your landlords, your tenants, whatever it is. Uh, speak to people. And um, things, it's amazing 
how uh, the banks, you know, even even the big banks want to help these days where they're happy to talk how you're going to get through this. So, yeah, please, please do. Um, uh, how to keep employees in good spirits. I mean, that's another great thing. I mean, you know, Zoom chats, uh, meetings, um, you know, speaking to your supply chain, see if you can create, you know, we're going in today to create a big staff Christmas uh, lunch before everyone goes off. Um, you know, we're just going to have some fun at one of the restaurants. You know, why not? Uh, so right from Twitter, direct message. Uh, what do you think will be some future food trends? Uh, well, so I, I'm not sure about food trends, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm absolutely adamant that people are looking more for experiences more than ever. I think people want, uh, they're not bothered about going to restaurants for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, like pre pandemic. I think people want to go to restaurants for a longer period of time. Um, it's a night out. It's not just something you're going to pop in on the way home from work. People are now planning to go out uh, and people are using our restaurants. Look at uh, putting the price up, but giving people longer times at tables. So we're not doing as many customers, but often a better experience. And that people are prepared, prepared to pay for that because they want a better experience. So I think that's the future of future food. How do you decide which recipes make the cut? This is Juan from uh, Instagram direct message. Well, it's purely taste, Juan. I mean, you know, when you taste the dish, when you all start to create new recipes, you know full well if it tastes absolutely delicious. Uh, and once it starts to taste delicious, even if it's ugly, you can make a dish beautiful. Uh, um, and that's uh, super, super easy to do once you've got the skill to make things look pretty. Uh, but the biggest skill is to make things taste delicious. Because once something tastes delicious, uh, one of my favorite restaurants in the world is a restaurant in Stockholm called Fransan. Uh, I go there, try to go there once or twice a year because the food is so delicious. I just cannot wait to go back. And all I get in my head is deliciousness. So always, always concentrate on flavor. Right. Kendrick from Facebook messages. Hello. What, according to you, is one must have dish and drink for the perfect Christmas dinner with family? Well, it's simple for me. Uh, I think it's got to be the, you know, whatever the, your meat choice is, whether it's turkey, beef, pork, lamb, um, it has to be the Christmas lunch. There's nothing like it, you know. Uh, you know, having the fire on, beautiful roast turkey, all cranberry sauce. So we're going to have beef this year. Uh, we've got a beautiful Lake District still on a beef. We're going to have all of the Sunday roast trimmings, you know, the beautiful Yorkshire puddings. I can't wait. I have a gorgeous uh, gravy of it. And I'm going to have this year, more than any year, I'm going to spare cash I've got on beautiful wine. Uh, and I'm just going to sit there uh, with my family and enjoy watching them wrap their presents more than ever because. I think one thing Lord learned us this year more than anything is how fragile life is and how amazing family is. And I think it's really important that we embrace uh, our family this year, but obviously keep it safe uh, more than any. So uh, that's going to be, that for me is the perfect recipe. Family, a good burgundy and a beautiful roast piece of sirloin from Lake District Farmers. So, uh, Carter from Instagram Dark Message, I've been loving your social kitchen isolation video on Instagram. How did the idea come about? Well, when we knew we were going to be in lockdown for a good few months the first time, um, I didn't really know what I was going to do. Um, I knew I had a lot of work to do to save the company. That was number one. Uh, number two, looking after all my staff was uh, important. Uh, and then number three was how do I connect with our customer base? The people have been using us for the last 10 years. How do we make sure that they stay loyal to our brand so when we reopen, they come back? The only thing I know how to do really is cook. So I said, let's do some amazing videos where we teach them in soil covered ingredients how to create some very simple recipes. We can have a bit of fun on there. We can teach them how to prep fish, uh, how to open scallops, how to join uh, a leg of lamb. Uh, you name it, uh, make basic sauces, stuff that people really want to do at home, bake bread. We did all sorts of cool stuff. And that's really how it came about, really. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it took a life of its own, uh, which was quite um, impressive. And what was really impressive for me is when we went back to work, the amount of people who came up to me in the kitchen at Pollen Street and thanked me for uh, doing them uh, because you know we didn't get any financial gain out of them it was purely just to connect with our customers really and make them feel um, cherished by our, our brand 
Um, and they just came up and said, well, you know, it's incredible how he gave us that time, you know, that time every day of two, three hours uh, where you didn't have to. So, yeah, I, I was super, super happy. Peter from uh, Facebook Messenger. Do all of your restaurants work with seasonal ingredients that are unique to local regions? Absolutely. So, you know, take a perfect example. When we went to open our restaurant in Cebu, sorry, I'm just going to take a quick uh, cup of drink of my coffee. We opened up a restaurant in Cebu in the Philippines. Uh, I went there, um, European restaurant, it's European tapas, but cooked with local ingredient. Um, a lot of people said to me that you will never uh, be able to get good product here i spoke to a lot of local chefs uh i think it's important um but i was determined to use the local product because i i've eaten some amazing filipino food um uh, and the product was fantastic so i'm like I, I was determined to be able to try and make that concept as um user friendly as possible so you know the all the middle class uh, and, and below could use that product uh, and that restaurant rather, and, and, and it wasn't going to become some elite restaurant where only the super rich could afford to eat there. And so I, uh, I said about it, uh, it became a local, now it's a local favorite, it's a local hit. Um, so yeah, we always try to use local product wherever we go in the world. Uh, I mean, there's some regions like Dubai where it's pretty impossible. We, we, we do work with local growers while growing micro herbs and stuff like that and vegetables uh, in these new super farms, what, they, what are all done by solar panels. Um, but apart from that, everything else is important. So we, we have to work with what we've got. Right. Um, uh, Aljit from Facebook Messenger, how did you manage to supply with ir irregular restaurant timings of all the lockdowns and restrictions? I'm finding it a bit hard myself for my restaurant, any advice? Absolutely, I mean, it's extremely difficult. You know, we, uh, it's very frustrating, you know, just like you, I'm sure when the news came, you got extremely angry for a few seconds and then you realise that, look, it's not personal. It is what it is. We have to deal with it. We have to face up to it. Um, you know, um, getting frustrated with it is only going to make your judgment cloudy. You have got to put your staff first, put your customers first uh and then put yourself after that and then cash flow is king look after your cash flow work with your supply chain i mean you know we were we were looking to have an absolute bumper christmas that's now not going to happen uh and you can sit there and talk about as much as you like about how much cash was was going to come through the business at this time it would have done this but it's not it's stopped so we just now have to accept where we are uh, again, speak to the suppliers, speak to uh, the landlords and drip feed them over the next couple of months until we can reopen. And then we start again um, and we go and we go once more. And hopefully this will be the last one. Now the vaccine started. Right. So uh, we're going to start to wrap up. Um, so the poll results, the poll results are in. We asked you, is your business prepared for Brexit? 40% of you said yes, and 60% said no. Well, you know, it's here, it's very real. Um, you know, we've been preparing for a no deal because my, my thinking in Boris Johnson's message for the last couple of years has been, he prefers a no deal, in my opinion. Um, so we have to accept that. Um, it's looking a little bit in, on a knife's edge this week. Uh, if he gets a deal, I'm I'm absolute for clarity. I didn't want Brexit. I f I feel it was nothing to do with business. It was purely a personal thing for me. I wanted to be a, a European citizen as well as a British citizen, uh, but that's my personal opinion. It's not affected in, on anything else. Um, but we have been getting ready for Brexit, um, and you know we're ready to uh, invest if. If it becomes more difficult to get French, Italian and Spanish wine into our country because the tariffs are so high, we will have to flip a lot of our wine list and more new world. Um, we're prepared for that. We've already started to look at how that looks. Um, we are looking at spirits, uh, how that works uh, and our cocktails um, and the mixers. And um, yeah, and, and we're, we're predominantly British based produce anyway. Uh, we don't get a lot of stuff from the continent. Uh, but again, the stuff we do do um you know we're speaking to the fishermen uh, because that's a contentious point at the moment uh, of how that works and how it's going to affect our our fresh uh, produce so yes we are absolutely getting ready we uh, took a license out to be able to do the tier staffing uh, which we did uh, a couple of years ago when we knew we we're probably going to go to the australian system um so i think it's very prudent that you do get ready um because it could affect your business 
Um, and uh, but I think um, you know we will be okay. Uh, we're a strong country, and I think together, united, we will get through this just like we'll get through the pandemic. So. If you have any questions, then please get in touch with the QuickBooks support team. And if you want to get in contact with me, send a direct message on Instagram underscore Jason Afton. Coming up on Ask the Expert tomorrow is Rachel Martin, who is the founder of Accountant underscore She, a female-led accounting firm that specializes in working with female entrepreneurs, influencers, and business owners. A reminder that if you need any more advice, join the official Intuit QuickBooks SMB community group on Facebook. Accountants and businesses are and experts are on hand 24 7 oh that leads me to wish you a merry merry christmas i hope you have a great time with all your family uh stay safe very important stick to the guidelines we are getting through this uh, it's very important we support the government uh, as we stand today it's been great answering your questions uh have a great day and merry christmas from me and everyone at the social company take care